sorry for the uh, technical glitches, but welcome to our presentation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Jean-Claude Theiss. Uh, Jean-Claude, Emeritus uh, Professor of Orthopaedic Surgery um, in the University of Otago. And uh, his topic for tonight is the Edwin Smith um, Egyptian papyrus and orthopedic surgery 5,000 years ago. So, Jean-Claude. Thank, well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Terry. Uh, and welcome to today's uh, uh, History of Medicine and Science lecture to those here present physically and those present uh, virtually. Right, first of all, I mean, how did I get interested in this topic? Um, well, I visited Egypt uh, in the 1980s, and uh, um, at the Cairo Museum shop, I found this uh, reproduction of one of the cases, uh, which uh, uh, is part of the Edwin Smith surgical papyrus. So, and as an orthopedic surgeon, I was particularly interested in this case, number 35, which is actually describing uh, a fractured clavicle, uh, including uh, uh, its treatment. Basically, this is uh, um, um, what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I'm not an, a historian. I'm not an expert in the, histo in the history uh, of uh, ancient Egypt. But we got an expert here, Terry Doyle, who um, was involved in the uh, examination uh, of the Dunedin uh, Egyptian mummy, which is kept at the uh, uh, Dunedin Museum. And he and other uh, authors published a paper in 2003 when they did the CT scan of, uh, of that mummy. And they also did some uh, radiocarbon-14 to uh, date uh, uh, the mummy. And uh, uh, you can see the age of the mummy is... Uh, uh, about 2,358 years before present time. So, so probably around 3,000 before Christ. And they established that, uh, they established the name of, of the mummy. She was female. Um, and the CT scan um, showed a few unusual uh, findings that the heart had been removed because normally the Egyptians would leave the heart remove the brain, but leave the heart. Uh, but in this particular case, um, the heart had been uh, uh, removed. And they also uh, found that the mummy had extensive dental disease and had very few uh, teeth left. Um, and uh, uh, they also examined the, the, the linen textile, uh, which the, the mummy is wrapped in. So um, that's the local flavor of my talk. When we talk about sort of medicine, we always, always talk about uh, Hippocrates, of course, so a Greek uh, physician as the father of medicine, and he certainly has contributed a lot to it. But um, actually, uh, the first Egyptian doctors lived a thousand years before uh, Hippocrates, and actually Hippocrates learned a lot from um, the Egyptian uh, physicians. And he actually, uh, I think, went to uh, Egypt uh, to learn uh, um, from them. Now, as an orthopedic surgeon, um, what, what he has really, uh, what he really contributed to orthopedics, uh, is this what's called the Hippocratic bench. So you look at this, you would think this is a, a medieval torture instrument, um, but it's actually the, um, an early orthopedic table, which we orthopedic surgeons use to reduce fractures uh, and uh, uh, dislocations. And in this case here, you actually can see that this patient has got the dislocated, uh, a dislocated hip. Uh, on on this side, on the uh, on the right side, and it basically uh, is attached by the ankle uh, on the uh, dislocated side, 
and then gradual traction is applied. They also put in some sort of a pillow between the legs to help the reduction of the, uh, the dislocation. <laughs> and the, con the counter traction is uh, through uh, uh, slings on uh, the underside of his, uh, in his armpits on his uh, uh, upper body. So it's a gradual procedure where you gradually increase the traction um, uh, to reduce the, the dislocation. Now this, uh, here go, if we go to Egypt, um, you can see um, uh, there was this uh, person called Imhotep and he was a real person, but there's very little known about, very little written about his involvement in medicine, but he became over the years, over the, the following sort of uh, two, three thousand years, he became uh, uh, being uh, revered as a god, the god of medicine. Um, but I come back to him because um, um, he he had also other uh, skills, which you will see later on. Now, my, my talk will go a little bit, uh, I talk a little bit about the history time, a bit about the timeline of ancient Egypt. I mean, um, I mean, you probably all remember having studied uh, the Egyptian history, uh, probably at high school. I certainly did. I talk a little bit about the Egyptian civilization because when we talk about medicine and um, you need to know the background, uh, an important part of, 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 of the development of, the, um, of medicine in Egypt was the embalming process. And I go through that. I talk a little bit about the medical knowledge, uh, which is mainly sort of uh, written down in the Ebus papyrus, and that's mainly related to internal medicine, whereas the Edwin Smith papyrus was a surgical papyrus, mainly describing uh, uh, injuries um, and their treatment. Now, when we look at the timeline, uh, it's, uh, I mean, the, the Egyptian kingdom, sort of the Egyptian uh, kingdom lasted for, for almost 3,000 years, um, and it's divided up into uh, the old, the middle, and the uh, new kingdom, as you can see there with the dates. And then there were intermediate periods uh, of instability, um, and uh, um, uh, for example, uh, Egypt was very peaceful until sort of the middle of the, the uh, until sort of the first intermediate period uh, when there was an invasion by the Hyksos uh, uh, people who came from uh, sort of uh, um, the Middle East. Um, and uh, um, then later on, uh, of course, uh, Egypt expanded under, under some of the pharaohs. They, they conquered sort of uh, uh, parts of the Middle East. Then later they were invaded by um, by the Persians, um, by Alexander the Great, and finally the Romans, which was the end of the uh, um, Egyptian Empire. Um, there were two kingdoms in Egypt. Egypt was divided into the upper and the lower Egypt. The upper being uh, the northern part. Uh, sorry, the upper being the um, uh, the um, southern part and the lower Egypt being the uh, northern part. And they were ruled by pharaohs, which were basically the, the kings. Uh, and their whole civilization was based on the River Nile. That was really their lifeline. And um, as a result of the, the River Nile, they were able to uh, achieve great things, including the, the, the building of the pyramids, as we know. They also um, developed uh, um, the hieroglyphic writing, which was uh, um, mainly on, on, I mean, and, and the papyrus, uh, which was also an, an Egyptian invention and which was a very important invention because a lot of the writing and the records uh, was on papyrus, which survived for uh, almost 5,000 years um, because of the climate uh, the dry climate uh, in uh, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Nile River, uh, 
is one of the, uh, the second biggest river in the world after the Amazon, I understand. <laughs> and it has actually, it has two uh, parts to it. The Blue Nile, uh, which comes from Central Africa. It's basically the outflow of Lake Victoria. And then the White Nile comes from the uh, um, Ethiopian highlands. And the White Nile carries 80% of the, the water. And the source of the Niles are still sort of, there's still some debate about it. Yeah. I mean, the, the history is that um, um, you probably know that uh, David Livingston, he was uh, an uh, explorer and missionary. He looked for the uh, source of the Nile, never found it. Um, and uh, um, there's a lot of lot written about uh, written about it. So the two branches of the Nile, they they join together sort of around um, sort of the city of Khartoum, which is the capital of Sudan. Then flow flow through the Nubian Desert, and then flow through Egypt, and then form the the delta uh, at the northern the northern part here, the delta, which then flows into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, now, at the time, in ancient Egypt, the, the Nile used to flood every once a year when there were heavy rains in the um, headwaters in, 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 in Central Africa and in Ethiopia, and then deposited this beautiful black silt, which was very fertile, so that allowed them to cultivate and to grow things. Uh, on either side of the Nile, and it was only a sort of an, an, an area of, of, of one mile either side. And then beyond that, it was desert, um, the Western and the Eastern desert. Um, um, but as a result of this uh, water, they were able to develop a great uh, civilization. Now, from a social point of view, the, the social pyramid was a quite well De delineated and of course you had the pharaoh the, the king at the top and then as as you went down um you had the the vizier was the, basically the prime minister um who was running the um, the country the government you had the priests which were very very high up in the social pyramid and the noble the nobles um, um as well the the soldiers, you can see, were very, very high up as well. They were very important here, obviously, to um, um, defend the country and keep it, uh, um, keep the uh, uh, invaders at bay. Now, they had a whole sort of group of scribes, and they were also, these were the, the people who used to um, write all the documents, um, record everything. And uh, including the, uh, the medical texts, they were all recorded by, by scribes. The merchants, of course, uh, um, producing uh, products and selling them. And they had a, the, the craftsmen who um, used to uh, um, uh, do the statues, the uh, pottery, the paintings. And below here, we had the peasants, the bottom, the, uh, the slaves. You all know of the um, of no, some of you probably have visited the uh, uh, the pyramids, and here the the three pyramids of Giza. Um, the three of them. This is the uh, the, the Khufu pyramid uh, where Pharaoh Khufu was uh, buried. Then there is the um, um, the, uh, the the Menkari one and the Kafri uh, uh, one. Uh, and this, the Great Sphinx, the Sphinx, uh, which is uh, part of the second pyramid. And the Pyramid of Giza, amazing. I mean, sort of uh, their engineers uh, were like the, 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 the physicians, were very well uh, uh, far ahead um, of their time. And to build, to build these pyramids um, um, was quite an... Uh, um, uh, achievement. Um, sort of the, the biggest, the big pyramid of Giza weighs about 5.5 .5 million tons, which is um, an, astronomical, an astronomical amount of uh, um, stone. Mm -hmm. They were made of 2.3 million limestone blocks put on top of each other, and each of these blocks weighed about 2,267 kilograms each. 
Apparently it took quite 23 years to complete and there were construction workers, 10,000 working on it um, uh, in shift. Now this painting here shows this, you can see this is a big statue here and it's moved on the sled here, you see that? They did not know the, the, the wheel until they, they were invaded by the Hyksos. The Hyksos, they, they, had the, they had horses and they had a wheel and they had chariots. But before that, the Egyptians did not know about the wheel and they did not know about the horses. So they copied the wheel from, the, uh, from their invaders. Uh, and that's why when the, the pyramid was built, they did not have uh, uh, wheels available. So they had uh, to use sleds or rollers. And you see this person here, what this person does is this person is sort of uh, putting water in front of the sled into the sand. Uh, and the reason for this is that, uh, of course, sand is, um, so of course they had to, so that they use these rollers here and then the big um, uh, slabs of uh, limestone pulled by, uh, by people. And if you, you know, to pull some stuff over sand is not easy, but um, to make it easier, you basically, uh, if you wet the sand, you first of all, two things happen. Uh, you reduce the friction um, of these sleds and these rollers by 50%, and you increase the hardness as well. Now, some of, if you if you ever driven on uh, the 90 mile beach, you can drive a car, but you drive it close to the water. If you drive it too far away from water, you get sort of you, you your car will uh, get stuck in the sand. And they've some people have done some experiments. So if you put too much water, it's no good either. So normally, the the best effect is when you got four percent of water. That's when you reduce the, the maximum reduction of the friction and you make the sand hardest. So the Egyptians, they knew that, and that's why they um, were wetting the sand when they were pulling these big blocks uh, over. How did they manage to, to get these big blocks to the top of the pyramid is that they had to build ramps, basically. So ramps, and then they could pull the blocks up and then as, as, as they went higher and higher, the, the, the ramps had to be longer and longer uh, to, so that you can't make them too steep. So, uh, and then uh, at the end, they removed the ramps. Uh, so that was the only way for them to get, uh, to get these blocks up to the top. The other thing is uh, the hieroglyphics, they're also sort of uh, um, quite amazing. They developed quite a sophisticated sort of way of writing. Um, and here is a representation of the, uh, of um, a bar relief of, of hieroglyphics. And they basically, um, um, there are two, uh, two types, basically uh, some of them, they had an alphabet and you can see here, this is, this is the alphabet, which uh, um, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, represents, uh, it represented by different uh, symbols. And then other, other hieroglyphics were, so they were phonograms and they re represented sounds like our letters, but there were also some ideograms which represented whole works. For example, a lion here would mean a lion or, or a snake here would mean a snake. So, so those were the hieroglyphics. Um, later on, they also de developed the hieratic sort of way of writing. Uh, of course, it's easier. I mean, it's e this is the cursive sort of hieroglyphics, which is easier to write and quicker to write. And they used that to write on papyrus. Um, now, an important uh, event in the um, decipherment of, of hieroglyphics was uh, the, you probably remember the Rosetta Stone, um, which was um, actually found by some uh, uh, soldiers of Napoleon. I mean, the French invaded uh, um, um, Egypt uh, uh, 
in the late 1700s, and they weren't there for very long when the British came, um, and the British uh, 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 invaded uh, Egypt in the, uh, I mean, uh, very early in the um, 1800s. Oh, but um, <laughs> some of the Napoleon soldiers, um, they discovered this Rosetta Stone, which basically uh, had a decree um, written in three languages, in hieroglyphic, in Demotic, which was also a cursive way of writing hieroglyphics, and in Greek. So as a result of that, a Frenchman, Jean-Francois Champollion, he was able to then translate um, uh, hieroglyphics. Um, and he did that in 1822. Um, so that was really very important to be able to read and the writings of the ancient uh, Egyptians. So that was uh, really very good. So here, here you can see, for example, um, this would be the, the writing in hieroglyphics, and you can see here the, the translation. This is actually from the Ebus papyrus. And, and that wasn't straightforward to translate those medical papyri, and it took some time uh, for somebody to, to translate it. Uh, and that was quite amazing. The other one is the making of papyrus. That was also an, 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 um, an, an uh, important uh, um, uh, discovery. So papyrus plant was growing along the River Nile in mar marshes and was easily available for them. And basically you use the uh, stems, use the stems of the plant, then you cut them into strips and then you lay those strips, uh, uh, first of all, first in horizontal, and then you lay another layer perpendicular to it. And then using a mallet, you crush the fibers, um, and then you dry, you dry it. So it's basically, the, the, basically what later on um, um, papyrus, what basically the, the mm -hmm. word paper comes from. And it was very light, and it was very durable and easy to transport. Whereas in the past, they had to other civilization wrote on stone or wrote on clay tablets, uh, which were more perishable, particularly the clay tablets and the stone tablets was, um, were heavy to, to transport. Now, when we come to orthopedic injuries, um, where do these injuries come from? Um, the ones described in the uh, uh, Edwin Smith papyrus. Well. Some people think that the Edmund Swiss papyrus was an, uh, a treaty of war injuries, but I'm sure that the war injuries have contributed significantly to the orthopedic injuries, but also the huge civil engineering projects. I mean, building those pyramids, I'm sure that people got, certainly a lot got killed, workers were, were, were killed, but I'm sure some of them also suffered significant injuries. So that's why I think they came from. But when we go to, uh, Egyptian warfare, as I already said, initially there it was a very peaceful country. There was no war until sort of uh, um, the 16 to 1500s uh, uh, BC, and that was as a result of the invasion by the Hyksos, uh, as I already said. And Egypt was pretty well protected uh, because. Uh, on, on the eastern side, on the western side, there were deserts, so that was not easy to get through. Um, in the south was also there was the Nubian Desert, uh, and in the north was the Mediterranean Sea. So they were relatively well protected from invasions. Now the Egyptian army initially only had infantry and navy. They had some some boats which they used on the River Nile uh, for transport. And the chariots, they copied uh, of the Hyksos, because the Hyksos, when they, they had chariots with wheels and drawn by, by horses. And the Egyptians uh, copied this, and that made their army uh, much more effective. Now, the infantry, they carried shields, uh, spears, and battle axes. And then they had also projectile sort of weapons, which you could throw at your, your enemy. Um, and bow and arrow uh, was, was a very uh, uh, um, important part of the uh, uh, the warfare in those days, 
days. And so, so this is the infantry here. So you can see they got no very little protection apart from the, the shields. They have these spears here and the shields were made of wood or what? animal hide. No, no. Egyptian archery, they were very, very good archers. Um, and you can see here an, an, a representation. Uh, and they used composite art, uh, arch, uh, archers, archery, sort of the bows were made not just of wood, but they had, they were laminated. They had um, a bone on the, on the inside <laughs> and then sinew on the outer side. Sinew is basically like tendon, which they took from, uh, from animals. So when you, when you um, uh, put the uh, bow under tension, the, um, the bone on the inner side would um, compress and the sinew, the tendons on the outer side would uh, stretch and that would increase the power of your, your bow. And they, the, these arrows could reach up to 250 meters, which was, was really quite, quite amazing. And this is an Egyptian chariot. So later on, once they, uh, um, they had copied this sort of, they had, they also then sort of had horses and there are normally two, two people on the chariot. One was, was guiding the horses, controlling the horses and the other one uh, and, and had a bow and arrow and other implements uh, to kill the uh, um, position. And here's the Navy. They um, um, had some boats uh, um, which were used on the River Nile. The weapons here, there were quite a number of uh, uh, weapons. Uh, as you can see here, there's a sort of a, um, they had some uh, um, uh, spears, they had back battle axes, uh, swords. Uh, as I said already, they had bow, and opposite bow chariot, and very few were wearing armor. So they were very, very uh, um, um, exposed to uh, uh, injury. So these battle injuries, what, what sort of injuries did the, um, um, they sort of uh, uh, cause? Well, there were, of course, head injuries. Uh, you know, if you hit on the head with a mace, uh, um, can cause head injuries. There's a lot of blunt, blunt trauma. Um, of course, penetrating wounds from swords and spears and arrows. Uh, spinal injuries, uh, you could fall off uh, um, of chariots and fractures, of course. And here is an, uh, an, an X-ray and a CT scan of a skull of, of one of the pharaohs where you can, you can see here a CT scan and the CD the 3D reconstruction gives you an amazing picture. And um, um, a lot of these mummies uh, were CT scanned, sort of you don't even need to open the coffin. You can <laughs> CT scan and, and tells you, shows you the skeleton uh, of the pharaoh and uh, uh, here you can see the, the fracture of the skull here, uh, of the frontal bone here. There's a fracture here just above the right orbit. And there's a fracture of the nose here. And also the a fracture of the cheekbone on, on the other side. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, uh, the case four of the Edmund Swiss papyrus, it uh, talks about a head injury. And it's quite amazing how the, that surgeon describes uh, uh, what he or she found uh, when examining um, this particular case. So obviously the, this, this patient had a wound, a scalp, a scalp wound, uh, and he was noticing that it was going right down to the bone and there was a split in the skull. So there was a skull fracture, splitting his skull. And he advised the, the doctors that if you have a case like this, you should palpate this wound, put your finger in the wound. And if you find something disturbing uh, under the fingers, um, I mean, you could disturbing. I'm not sure you meant if you find some brain under the under under the uh, um, uh, at the tip of your finger, and if the patient uh, uh, shudders exceedingly, if the patient has got sort of uh, maybe fever and uh, uh, rigors. Um, and if the swelling which is over it protrudes, 
uh, probably meant that if there is a brain tissue protruding through the uh, skull and discharges blood from those nostrils and ears, which would point to a fracture of the base of the skull, uh, which often leads to um, sort of bleeding through the nose and the ears. And if he suffered, suffers from stiffness of the neck, that would be a sign of infection of the, um, the meninges or the meningitis. So it could well be that this, this patient already had an, uh, an, a meningitis <laughs> a secondary inf infection. And then he was saying that this is something I can try to treat, I, which I will contain. Now, then comes the treatment. So he, he advised that this patient should be treated as follows. You, sit, you make him sit, so you don't get him up and walk him around and make him two supports of brick until he has uh, um, reached a decisive point. And then you should apply grease to his head and soften his neck there with and both of his shoulders. Another open skull injury where they describe actually the brain um, and they describe that sort of brain looked like corrugations which in molten cup, copper and something throbbing because if you do a craniotomy, you open the brain, the, um, the, the brain is actually pulsating, so throbbing and fluttering under the fingers. And he then compared it to, uh, uh, in, in children, the skull is not completely formed. They are the fontanelles, which is not bone, but it's just uh, fibrous tissue. And you can, in a child, you can actually feel the brain through the skin and the fibrous tissue. And that's what he meant by the weak place of the infant's crown. So they had really a good sense of observation, how they described, described it and how they uh, got the knowledge and passed on the knowledge. And then the last thing is the religion and the belief in afterlife, the Egyptians, of course, had, were, were, uh, had a lot of gods they believed in, and they believed in afterlife, and, and afterlife was very important for them. And some of the pharaohs spent all their life building, uh, building their own um, tomb um, and spent a lot of effort and money in, in, in doing so, because that was very, very important to them. Now, the embalming and mummification was um, something which, which really helped uh, the physicians and the surgeons because they basically is what was basically like an autopsy. So what, what they used to do to prepare the body for the afterlife, it was very important that the body was intact and a special way of preparing the body so that they, they could uh, enter uh, afterlife. So here you can see two, two people there. One is sort of working on the brain. They're doing something uh, around the nose. And here you can see, and this one here pulls out some, uh, some bowel. Um, and um, then once they had taken out all the inner organs uh, and only the bones and the skin was left and the heart, because mm -hmm. the bones and the skin mm -hmm not rot and would be preserved. Then they would wrap them in lin linen and then put them into their um, um, sarcophagus. And the embalming was a very, um, a very uh, long process. It took about 70 days to do this. And it was done by the priests. Uh, and that's why the reason of uh, that a lot of uh, the, in the, the early physicians were priests and physicians at the same time. So they actually learned quite a lot by doing the, by doing the, um, um, the embalming because they got to know and, and touch the, um, the inner organs. Um, so they did, a, they did a, an incision over the left side of the abdomen. And then through that, they, they managed to remove all the, um, um, the organs the, 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 um, certainly the, um, the bowel, they removed the liver, and then they must have do, done an incision in the diaphragm to be able to remove the lungs, but they left the heart because that, they thought that's what the, the, where the soul was uh, located. Um, the, they didn't think a lot of the brain. They said the brain was 
So they thought the brain was useless and they removed it. Now they did not want to, to, to damage the skull because they wanted the, the, the body to look perfect to enter the afterlife. So they actually removed it through the nose by using a metal hook. Um, then once they've done all of that, then they rinse the body with wine and spices and then put natron salt, salt in it to dehydrate it. And they left that for quite a long time until the, the rest of, I mean, until the, um, the skin was dehydrated. And then the body was uh, wrapped in linen and then covered with gum. And the organs, they were kept separately and they were take, they were buried with the, um, uh, with the mummy and they kept them in canopic, uh, what's called canopic jars. Now this is, this is the, um, uh, the removal of the brain. So they had quite a number of instruments with hooks and knives and things like that to be able to do this. And they basically entered the, 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 the cranium through the nose and, and through the, um, the base of the skull. And it's probably the first sort of neurosurgical operations, but neuro, uh, neurosurgeons, they carry out one operation, which is uh, a removal of the pituitary gland, which is a gland sort of just at the base of the, um, uh, the skull. And this is a gland which, which sort of uh, controls all the, the hormones and they nowadays they do it endoscopically by by passing an endoscope through the esmod sinus into the uh, uh, to the base of the skull and then they can remove the uh, the uh, pituitary <laughs> tumor so th these are the canopic jars where the uh, the intestines and the liver and the lungs and the stomach were put into different uh, uh, Jars. I didn't realize that. They were buried with those. So as a result, as a result of doing all this embalming, um, uh, they got a very good knowledge of, of anatomy. Um, and uh, basically these embalmers were, the, were basically the first anatomists. Um, and they knew about the heart, sort of uh, the lung, the kidney, the bladder, the stomach, bowel and brain so they knew about this as far as the sort of uh, the nerves the arteries veins and ligaments because they had one term for for all of these and they didn't really differentiate very much the nerves between the nerves and the the arteries um, but it also led to some physiological knowledge and they must they they knew about the pulse they knew about the heart action and also because they saw all these vessels coming out of the heart so they knew about that um, that as well uh, although the physiological knowledge was limited but they had very good knowledge of the anatomy so medical practice in ancient egypt i mean here's a here's a, uh, a painting here which shows obviously this these are the uh, the support of the bricks which uh, uh, one of the cases of edwin smith's cases was uh, uh, talking about to support the patient and i'm not sure what's wrong with the patient this is somebody administering some medication this one here has got a papyrus maybe sort of reading some incantation and some spell and then here some people who look like they're praying to to the gods um so a lot of the ancient medical practice in egypt was uh, was based on uh, uh, on magic, on spells and incantations, as the uh, so the Ebus papyrus was certainly based on that. Um, the first mention of a physician uh, was in, was three thousand five hundred before Christ, and um, that's that's the physician, uh, physician's name, and he became famous because he he apparently healed Pharaoh Sahura's from a disease of his nostrils. I, I couldn't find out what was wrong with his nostrils, but there we go, he became famous. Um, the Greek um, historian uh, sort of basically uh, wrote this, the practice of medicine is so divided among them that each physician is a healer of one disease and no more. So they were quite specialized. You had ophthalmologists, you had dentists, um, 
And he also was saying all the countries are full of physicians, some of the eye, some of the teeth, some of what pertains to the belly, and some of the hidden diseases. Um, and initially, there was no clear, clear boundary between medicine, religion, and magic. It was all one thing. And as I said already, the priest and the doctors were often one and the same. And the priests were called wabu, uh, which means to purify. And they used magical spells and incantations. They also had gods of medicine, um, and they were they were they were here, and they were there were three main ones, and they were associated with healing and restoration of life. Um, now the physicians uh, here's a list of 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 physicians who were mentioned in some writings. I mean, I already told you about Imhotep, who became a god, basically. But you can see they were not just doctors. I mean, he was a prime minister, he was a doctor, he was a high priest, he was a chief builder. He was actually an architect um, uh, under the Pharaoh Joseph, who built the, um, the step pyramid in, in Saqqara. He was a sculptor and maker of vases, so he had a lot of um, skills. This one here was a a dentist. Um, this one here was an, an ophthalmologist. Um, there were there were lady doctors as well. And this one here was she was the lady overseer of the female physicians. Um, this one here was a chief physician and dentist, a scorpion charmer, and he was an admiral of the royal fleet. So quite various. Uh, skills um, and they had medical schools at the end towards the end of the uh, ancient uh, uh, Egypt they had medical schools and they were called houses of life because as a doctor you restore uh, life and the medical papyri they're quite a number it's not just the uh, Edwin Smith um, there are a whole range of papyri but the two important ones are the Ebers one here and the Edmund Smith. Then there are others um, as well which have been described. Now the, the Ebers was, George Ebers was German and he he studied law first and then he um, did some degrees in uh, oriental languages and uh, archaeology and then he became a professor and uh, taught in Leipzig in uh, in Germany. And the Ebers papyrus is actually now kept in Leipzig in, in Germany. He, he bought the, uh, this papyrus in Luxor, which uh, uh, used to be the old, uh, old capital of Thebes. And he bought it off Edmund Smith uh, via Edmund Smith because Edmund Smith knew about this papyrus. And uh, Ebers bought it in uh, um, 1871. And the Ebers papyrus is mainly, mainly a medical sort of, uh, there's very little surgery there. Um, it's basically um, covering different medical con conditions um, and has got an extensive um, um, sort of extensive um, treatment prescription. And they had quite a lot of uh, uh, things they used to heal people. But it was, it was all empiric knowledge a lot of magical spells and religious incantations. So there were almost 900 individual texts uh, covering uh, quite a number of areas in, of medicine, internal medicine, eye disorders, skin disorders, uh, diseases of the extremities, and then gynecology. They knew a bit about, there was a bit written about the cardiovascular system and ulcers. It was about 20 meters long, the interesting thing, there was one part was actually uh, a bit more scientific, and that was uh, uh, talking about the heart, um, about the knowledge of the center of the blood supply, and all the vessels contacting every part of the body. But they they thought that the vessels did not just carry carry blood, but they also carried tears and urine and sperm. And there was even a chapter on depression and dementia, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, quite surprising. You know, some of those prescriptions were quite interesting. And here's one for probably for diabetes, because this is a, 
a patient who is quite emaciated, has lost a lot of weight and has got quite, is, is sort of has a problems with thirst. And if you diabetes, if it's, if, uh, it can lead to polyuria, lots of urine and, and, and abnormal thirst. And here um, uh, they were sort of uh, um, prescribing uh, some treatment for this which you can read here is uh, um, quite a number of things here um, um, for this um, illness, which they were saying was mortal, the patient would not survive. And then there are the spells, um, for example, as a spells to the, uh, the, the Egyptian gods. Um, and uh, um, these are spells, which every time you um, um, prepare a medicine, um, you should uh, um, recite this, um, this spell. And here, the, they had quite a lot of things they used uh, for, for medication. Here's a, a very short list. I mean, there's a long, long list, but you can see they had, they had access to opium, and they grew opium, cannabis as well, and then a lot of other sort of, vet, um, sort of uh, things um, you can see here. Now, interestingly, aspirin, as you know, is one of the oldest drugs uh, known, and actually, it was actually known in Egypt, and he, they extracted it from the, the bark of the willow tree, and as we all know, it's analgesic and antipyretic, and so it was, a, apparently, it was available. Now, coming to Edwin Smith, um, he was an American uh, um, dealer, um, and he sort of bought the um, this papyrus of somebody in Luxor again same place uh, in 1862 I think he bought it um, and then uh, um, <clears throat> it was sort of written around they it was they think it was written around the 17th century BC but it appears that it was a copy of earlier texts so. Uh, the, the, the authorship, who wrote it, it they don't know. Uh, it was discovered in a tomb in Luxor. Um, and of course, Edmund Smith bought it in 1862. He didn't do a lot about it. Um, and when he died, his daughter donated it to the New York Historical Society, who then um, sort of it eventually ended up in the hands of a chap called James Prestett, who published it, translated it, and published it in two volumes. Um, and currently it resides in New York in the uh, um, Academy of Medicine. There it is. It's uh, not as long as the Ebus papyrus. Um, of course, it's written in hieroglyphics. And it's concerned mainly um, uh, with trauma and surgery. Now, the content, what it's it's 48 cases. Basically, the surgeon describes 48 cases and it involves wounds, simple wounds, but frac mainly fractures. And it only it's only uh, related to the skull, the spine, and the upper limbs, and then it stops. Uh, so there's nothing regarding the lower limbs. So it's possible that the cases related to lower limbs got lost don't know, or they were not uh, um, sort of transcribed from older um, texts and it sort of the text ends abruptly in the middle of a sentence in case 48 and they were quite the cases the way they described it they were quite systematic there was always an introduction and then described the significant symptoms and then the diagnosis and then the treatment. They basically knew about prognosis. So they knew a little bit, this is a case I can, I can heal, I can do something. And then there are conditions where I can't do anything. But then in between there might somewhere I can try. So uh, here are the, the types of cases. So there were a lot of, there were quite a number of spine cases. Um, there were uh, cases, what they describe as dislocation of blows, collarbones, which was unlikely, so probably sternoclavicular dislocation. There was a clavicle fracture, the humerus fractures. There were quite a lot of head injuries, 27 cases of head injuries. There were throat and neck injuries, uh, chest injuries, and one injury to the shoulder. 
And a fracture of the collarbone is, um, I, I use that as an example, for example, here, um, basically, uh, the surgeon describes the examination of the patient. If you examine a man having a break in his collarbone and uh, define that the collarbone is short and separated from his fellow, you should, the diagnosis is a, is a fracture of the, of the clavicle and I can, I can treat that. Mm -hmm. And this is a, an x-ray, of course, nowadays it's easy for us, much easier by an x-ray. You can see that the ends overlap, so it shortens, basically. And then here's the treatment, and it's still very much what we do these days, 5,000 years later. So he basically says, put the patient on their back, and you fold something between the shoulder blades, and that will then distract the two ends of the bone and, and bring the fracture back into place, the bone back into place. And then you make him a, a, a splint, uh, and you apply, uh, apply some, and treat it with honey every day until he recovers. And even this, in this day and age, we often treat these fractures without surgery. And you can see this is exactly what he described, what we now use a, a figure of eight clavicle brace, which pulls the shoulder back, shoulders backwards, reduces the fracture, and holds in the position, allowing it to heal. And then here's an, um, um, and then they, they sort of had quite a lot of detailed knowledge of, uh, of uh, spinal injuries and head injuries and spinal cord injuries. And here uh, he describes sort of a dislocation of the vertebral column and notice, notes that this had led to paralysis, to uh, paralysis of the arms and legs. So basically quadriplegia. Um, and uh, um, they knew about, uh, obviously knew about the, the spinal cord, et cetera. And then the diagnosis uh, again was here. And here he, they, he said, this is a medical condition that I cannot heal. I can't do anything about this. So as I said, they knew about the what had a good prognosis and what had a bad prognosis. They obviously had a, a, open fractures, and that was a disaster because uh, there were serious injuries, and often the patient did not survive. But an interesting here was the way they treated open fractures. Um, on the first day, they used fresh meat as a hemostatic, then followed by honey, which uh, was absorbing the, um, um, the moisture, and oil, interestingly, to prevent sticking of the dressing. Um, and they also put moldy bread on it, uh, which is interesting because actually penicillin, the antibiotic, was first extracted from molds. So whether that was uh, used as an anti local antibiotic, uh, possible, possibly, I'm not sure. Amputations, there's very little. Uh, here are some paint, some some drawing which shows some amputated hands and penises, but I think that's mainly from um, uh, captives uh, doing warfare. Uh, I don't think they, care, they did amputations. Um, what other uh, evidence is there for, for of surgical knowledge, but comes mainly from, from paintings and uh, um, they found some surgical instruments, also the, um, the, evaluate, the uh, CT scanning of mummies, looking at bones and even prosthesis. Circumstance, circumcision and castration. Yes, circumcision, they did circumcise. Castration, they took, I mean, there are some slaves, some eunuchs um, described, uh, but it's not quite clear. Anesthesia, we have an anesthetic in the audience. <laughs> uh, anesthesia was very little, but they had access to opium. Um, and then they use this uh, mandrake fruit here, which has had some, some hallucinogenic effect as well, and some, the same effect as the atropine, which is used in anesthesia to reduce the secretions uh, during surgery. They had access to cannabis and lots of beer, alcohol, beer. Uh, and then they were talking about pressure points on artery and nerves. Uh, and here is an, um, an sort of a, a representation of an. Um, this lo looks like an, um, a pharaoh who who using an is using an, a walking stick, so he must have something wrong. And this is the mandrake fruit. Yeah. 
And opium, of course, was available. They were growing opium, um, and it was cultivated in Thebes. And some of the opium actually has got the name of opium sebacum or sebane. So that was available. The instruments here, they're quite various. Um, quite a lot of instruments were found. These are like awls, like to sort of perforate bone. There's some needles here. Uh, there's a bar relief here of, uh, um, of quite a number of different instruments, including blades, saw blades, probes, knives, scissors, all sorts of things. This is an interesting x-ray here of an, uh, a mummy which has got a, 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 a metal splint inside the knee, which was probably inserted um, after death for reasons we don't know. Some more surgical instruments there. Um, some of it, also some orthopedic pathology, uh, like this one here. This mummy had obviously tuberculosis here with the formation of the spine. This was a uh, skeleton of, of an ache of a dwarf um, and here you can see an achondroplastic dwarf here this is a lady who's got a very increased uh, uh, arch of the lumbar spine probably due to dislocated hips and this one here uses a stick this one here's got a withered limb with a foot drop here and a short leg fractures and dislocations yes they treated this they they used to splint them as you can see, they used uh, um, bark and uh, wooden sticks. This was an interesting case of a mummy. They did a CT scan and found that the hip had been damaged, probably from sepsis and that from an infection and probably died of that. This is the same uh, uh, I showed you before with a, a head injury. And then autopsy of mummies, you could see that some of them have been treated for fractures and they healed quite well. This is a CT scan showed a club foot in one of the, uh, um, the, the foot is short and bent. And they even did had some prosthesis, but um, of a big toe here, as you can see. So the fractures were treated, uh, they used splints and they, they didn't, they had an early sort of type of plaster, which made of linen bandages, powdered beans and barley and honey. And then they put some resin on it and it stiffened and it was sort of like an, uh, uh, like a plaster. They did some wound suturing. And this was, they used plant fibers, hair, tendons, wool thread and wound care. Uh, they used a lot of honey. And interestingly, uh, I was working in Africa uh, last three years, and we use a lot of honey on, on chronic um, the bone infections. Um, so it, it seems to have an antiseptic effect. Um, and then you, for those who are doctors, you know, when we used to do a prescription, we used to always write this R here, Rx, and it appears like that comes from um, the Egyptian god Horus, uh, um, that was his sort of eye, and that ended up as a sort of uh, used by pharmacists, uh, etc. There was also the, the physicians were also regulated, as I said, they were overseers and head physicians, and um, the doctors had to to really follow a strict line of treatment. And if they didn't do that, that was a capital crime. But they were allowed to modify the treatment after four days if it didn't work. And the uh, Babylonians, uh, they, they were quite stricter that if uh, you perform an operation and it kills someone or cuts out his eye, the doctor's hands shall be cut. So that was quite dramatic. So in summary, um, the Edwin Smith papyrus and the other papyra are really um, the earliest no writing where they got rational clinical observation and reasoning in medicine. It was of course a textbook of orthopedic trauma and they described some neurosurgical injuries. Um, and it was the first medical text moving away from this magic and superstition towards scientific-based approach to medicine. If you're interested in this, um, uh, there were very good books by Wilbur Smith. He, he wrote a whole series on Egypt. I wrote The River God and I was fascinated. Um, so if you are interested, I recommend that you read it. Oh, yeah. So thank you very much for um, uh, listening good. to uh, my talk. I hope um, um, it um, um, 
has sort of brought back memories from studying uh, um, Egyptian history in the past. And thank you very much. From Claude. Now, questions. Any questions? They had, if they were, if they were well off, they could afford sugar, so they had bad teeth. And apparently they, they added sand, sand to the sugar for one reason. And of course, the sand was damaging the animal of the teeth. So, so they all had, they all, all the pharaohs had bad teeth as the, um, the, uh, the mummy here in Dunedin. Now you, you scanned her and, and I think she had only six teeth left or something like that. Yeah. Jean-Claude, could you tell us a bit more about your use of honey in Africa? Is it, and I guess with the Egyptians as well, was that like a, a folk remedy or how effective was it? Uh, tell us well, I, apparently bacteria, they don't grow in honey because of the, there's too much sugar. Uh, apparently you cannot grow bacteria on honey. Um, so yes, we use it on the ward um, in chronic osteomyelitis, open wounds. Uh, I mean, you, you would have to do a, some sort of a control, placebo control trial by to see whether it's effective or I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure. I always kept saying when I was doing the wood run, they were saying, oh, we, we put honey on the, uh, uh, on the wood. And I said, oh, I prefer the honey on my toast. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, no more questions. I'd like you please to join me in thanking Jean-Claude for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.